What's going on YouTube? I'm Nick the Tutor, and today I'm gonna to be going through every single question for module one of reading and writing for the first practice test for the digital SAT. I'm gonna go through all of the answers. I'm also gonna go through strategies. I'm gonna let you see a bit of a window into my thoughts and how I go about the test. Make sure to drop a comment down below. If there's anything you don't understand, I will respond to those comments to make sure to help you guys and hit that subscribe button because I'm gonna be answering every single question for the digital SAT so you don't wanna miss it. Let's get into it. So one of the strategies, important strategy, is you wanna read the question first on English. And that's because you don't know whether it's an English question or a grammar question. So here, which choice completes the text with the most logical and precise word or phrase? So we're looking for a word that you know, basically completes this sentence. Former astronaut Ellen Ochoa says that although she doesn't have a definite idea of what might happen, she blanks. So she doesn't have a definite idea. So she blank that humans will someday need to be able to live in other environments than those found on Earth. This conjecture, right? So we know she doesn't have a definite idea and also she's using conjecture. So we'll be looking for a word that represents when someone doesn't have that definite idea and they're using conjecture. Conjecture is kind of like guessing, right? So it's not gonna be demands or establishes. And we have speculate. So she speculates that humans will someday need to be able to live in other environments. That fits the sentence. It also fits the idea that she doesn't know what, exactly what to do and she also is engaging in conjecture. So the answer would simply be B. All right, let's get into number two. Which choice completes the text with the most logical and precise word or phrase? So another word in context here. We want to read around and make sure we find one of these words that fits within the context. Beginning in the 1950s, Navajo Nation legislator Ann Dodge Weneka continuously worked to promote public health. So she continuously worked. This blank effort involved traveling throughout the vast Navajo homeland and writing a medical dictionary for speakers of Dine Bazad, the Navajo language. Apologies if I botched that pronunciation. But once again, we're looking for something that indicates that she continuously worked. So we have impartial, offhand, persistent, and mandatory. So persistence is usually something where you're doing something multiple times over a long period of time. So persistent C would be the correct answer. Right, let's get into number three. Which choice, once again, completes the text the most logical and precise word or phrase? One thing you'll notice about the digital SAT guys is they're actually grouping questions together. Even though uh, the English questions and the reading questions are intermixed, they're going to be grouping questions together, which is really important. We're going to have a bunch of these in a row, so let's get into it. Following the principles of community-based participatory research, tribal nations and research institutions are equal partners in health studies conducted on reservations. So they're equal partners. A collaboration between the Crow Tribe and Montana State University blank this model. Tribal citizens worked alongside scientists to design the methodology and continue to assist in data collection. So they're saying that they're equal partners. It's a collaboration. They work alongside each other. And they're giving this as an example. So this collaboration between Crow Tribe and Montana, Montana State University circumvents this model. It kind of shows that this model works, right? So eclipses, fabricates, and we have exemplifies. Exemplifies sounds like example. It means that it's the perfect example for what they're talking about. So D would be the correct answer for number three. All right, let's get right into number four. Once again, we have a word in context question. Uh, the parasitic daughter plant increases its reproductive success by flowering at the same time as the host plant it latched onto. So it flowers at the same time. In 2020, uh, this person and his colleagues determined that the tiny daughter achieves this blank with its host by absorbing and utilizing a protein the host produces when it is about to flower. So it achieves this blank. This is two plants working together, one that's parasitic and then the host plant. So they work together and they're saying that this daughter plant achieves this blank. So they're working together. So we have synchronization, hibernation, it's a parasitic plant, right? Prediction and moderation. Also, synchronization means two things working together in unison. So that would be the correct answer, choice A. All right, so let's get into number five. Once again, we have a word in context question. Given that the conditions in binary star systems should make planetary formation nearly impossible, it's not surprising. So something's not surprising. That means they don't really um, understand what's going on, right? Because they said, given the conditions should make planetary formations nearly impossible, it's not surprising, right? So they can't determine this. It's not surprising that the existence of planets in such systems has lacked blank explanation. So it's lacked 
you know, a clear explanation, right? So we have discernible, straightforward, inconclusive, that's the reverse of what we're looking for, and then unbiased, we're not talking about bias, right? So um, it lacks a discernible explanation or it lacks a straightforward explanation. Well, they said that certain conditions make planetary formation impossible. It's not surprising that the existence of planets in such system has lacked a clear explanation. So in this instance, the answer would be choice B, straightforward, which is better than A, discernible, which is not exactly correct based on the context. All right, let's get right into number six. Uh, once again, we have a word in context question. Seminole Muskogee director Sterling Harajo, blank television tendency to situate native characters in the distant past. This rejection, so that's a key word right there. He's rejecting this tendency to put them in the distant past. It's evident in his series Reservation Dogs, which revolves around teenagers who dress in contemporary styles and whose dialogue is laced with current slang. So he's a trailblazer in this respect, right? He's not fitting into this tendency to put native characters in the distant past. So Sterling Harajo blank this tendency. So he, he goes against it, right? So we have repudiate, proclaim, foretell, and recant, right? So once again, repudiate means to go against it. So the answer choice will be A, repudiate. Let's get into number seven. Once again, uh, we want to read the question first. Which choice best states the main purpose of the text? Now we've moved on from those word and context questions, and now we have a main point question. So this is now a reading comp question. We're really going to want to read this for the context, right? So in 2007, computer scientist Louis von Ahn was working on converting printed books into a digital format. He found that some words were distorted enough that digital scanners couldn't recognize them, but most humans could easily read them. Based on that finding, Von Ahn invented a simple security test to keep automated bots out of websites. The first version of the reCAPTCHA test asked users to type one known word and one of the many words scanners couldn't recognize. Correct answers proved the users were humans and added data to the book digitizing project. So this is a summary of how this gentleman, Lewis, came up with the reCAPTCHA test and what he did with it, right? So basically the summary would be that, right? So A, uh, what's the main purpose? To discuss Von Ahn's invention of reCAPTCHA. That's probably going to be the correct answer. To explain how digital scanners work, no, right? To call attention to Von Ahn's book digitizing project. Now, this was part of a different project, so that's not it, to indicate how popular it is now, right? So that's going to be choice A. Let's move on to number eight. Uh, which choice best describes the function of the underlying sentence? We want to know what this sentence does within this, this paragraph here, right? So it's a text from a novel and a lily and a companion are walking through a park. All right, let's see. So Lily had no real intimacy with nature, but she had a passion for the appropriate and could be keenly sensitive to a scene which was the fitting background of her own sensations. The landscape outspread below her seemed an enlargement of her present mood. All right, so she's saying that the scene, she's keenly sensitive to a scene with which was the fitting background of her own sensations. And now we're talking about her mood and she found something of herself in its calmness, its breath, long free reaches, right? So this sentence is kind of expanding on the prior sentence. Uh, on the nearer slopes, the sugar maples wavered like pyres of light. Lower down was a massaging of great orchards, and here and there, the lingering green of an oak grove. So how does this function? It kind of expands upon the fact that she takes her sensations from the scene. Uh, creates a detailed image of the physical setting. Uh, no, that, that's more so what this sentence does. It establishes that a character is experiencing an internal conflict. Uh, she's more experiencing her own mood. Uh, it makes an assertion of the next sentence then expands on. Uh, it's kind of the reverse. And then we have choice D. It illustrates an idea that is introduced in the previous sentence. So yes, it expands upon that idea. So choice D would be correct. All right, let's get into number nine. Uh, which choice best states the function of the underlying sentence? So once again, we're trying to see how this, this underlying portion functions in this paragraph. So a study by a team including finance professor Madhu suggests that exposure to sunshine during the workday can lead to overly optimistic behavior. So that's sort of a, you know, an exclamation of a certain principle. Um, using data spanning from 1994 to 2010 for a set of U.S. companies, the team compared over 29,000 annual earnings forecasts to the actual earnings later reported by those companies. So that's like some sort of data that they could use to analyze this. Uh, the team found that the greater the exposure to sunshine at work, uh, the more the managed forecast exceeded what the company actually earned. So 
Um, we had a concept when this is an example of how they figured it out. And then this is a conclusion, right? So which choice best states the function underlying sentence to summarize the results? I don't think it really summarizes the results, right? To present a specific example that illustrates the study's findings. Uh, kind of. It, this doesn't really illustrate anything, though. This part really illustrates the findings. Um, C, to explain part of the methodology used in a team study. So that would probably be it because there they're kind of explaining how they, you know, captured this data on, um, on earnings. And then this is more of the conclusion of what this all says, right? So I think this part, which they're asking about, would be choice C. If they ask you about this part, which they didn't, of course, that's where it probably would have been B. And then D is, uh, is incorrect. Let's get into number 10. Once again, according to the text, what is true about mother? So now they're asking us something very specific about mother. And, okay, let's see what they say about mother. She did not spend all of her time paying dull visits to dull ladies and sitting dully at home waiting for dull ladies to pay visits to her. So she's not boring. She was almost always there, ready to play with the children, read to them, and help them do their home lessons. Besides this, she used to write stories for them while they're at school and read them aloud after tea. And she always made up funny pieces of poetry. So the mom is really cool and fun, right? So she wishes more ladies would visit her. No. Birthdays are a favorite special occasion. They mention birthdays, but they don't say that. She creates stories and poems for her children. Yeah, so she does all this fun stuff for her kids. Uh, reading to her children is her favorite activity. Uh, it may be, but I don't think it really says that. So we're going to go with choice C. Let's get into number 11. So here we sit, we have this question, which choice best states the main purpose of the text, which is a poem, right? So we want to find the main purpose of this poem. The following text is from Maggie Pogue Johnson's poem. She's addressing Paul Lawrence Dunbar, a black author, right? So thou with stroke of mighty pen. So she's saying his pen is mighty. That means he's probably a good writer. Has told of joy and mirth. And read the hearts and souls of men as cradled from their birth. So he understands people. Uh, the language of the flowers, thou has read them all. So he's very well read. And e'en the little brook responded to thy call. So uh, whatever that means, it looks like people respond positively to him. So she thinks he's smart. She thinks he's a good writer. And people really like what he's doing, right? So we want something that has a positive tone to it. A, praise a certain writer for being especially perceptive regarding people and nature. So we have the brook, we have flowers, we have the souls of men, and then she's saying he's mighty. So that is probably going to be the correct answer. B, to establish that certain writer has read extensively. Uh, you know, she says that, but that's not the main point. To call attention to a certain writer's careful and elaborately detailed writing process. Not really discussing that. To recount fond memories of an afternoon spent. So no, it's going to be choice A. Let's get into number 12. Which quotation from to you most effectively illustrates the claim? So we're looking for um, the quotation that comes after this prompt that effectively illustrates the claim that was given here. So it's a poem by Walt Whitman. In the poem, Whitman suggests that readers whom he addresses directly have not fully understood themselves. So we're looking for something that says the readers don't fully understand themselves. So A, you have not known what you are. You have slumbered upon yourself. So that pretty much answers it right there, right? That saying that the readers don't understand themselves, so it's probably going to be A. Uh, these other ones are kind of unrelated. You can see they don't talk about the readers themselves knowing themselves. So we're going to go with A there. All right, let's look at number 13. Which finding, if true, will most directly support the student's claim? So we're looking for a direct support. Uh, born in 1891, uh, Martin Chambie stakes here one of the most renowned figures of Latin American photography. Uh, in his paper, student claims that Chambi's photographs have considerable ethnographic value. In his work, Chambi was able to capture diverse elements. So look something that supports that Chambi was able to take pictures of a diverse group of people. Chambi took many commissioned portraits of wealthy Peruvians, but he also produced hundreds of images carefully documenting the people, sites, and customs of indigenous communities. So not only did he take wealthy people's photographs, he also took indigenous people's photographs. So A looks like it's going to be the correct answer. Quickly want to review the remaining ones just to make sure, but um, these don't relate to him taking a diverse group of photographs. So we're going to go with A. Let's look at number 14. Which choice most effectively uses data from the table to complete the example? So we want to use the table, but we also want to make sure that what we put completes the example that they're given, right? So some researchers studying indigenous actors and filmmakers in the United States have turned their attention to the early days of cinema. 
the tens and twenties where people like James Young Deer, blah, 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 were involved one way or another with numerous films. In fact, so many films and associated records for this era have been lost that counts of those four figures output should be taken as bare minimums. So these numbers, you know, how many films they were in here, right, are bare minimums rather than totals. It's entirely possible, for example, that. So we're going to be looking for an answer choice that indicates that these people did way more films than this chart says. Uh, Dark Cloud acted in significantly fewer films, so that's not going to be it. Uh, Edwin, uh, 47 roles include only films made after 1934. Um, that's not what the chart says, so that's wrong. Uh, Lillian St. Cyr acted in far more than 66 films, and Edwin directed more than 58. So that would be showing that they were in many, many more films than were was pr uh, indicated here. And the James Young Deer actually directed 33 films and acted in only 10. So that would be fewer once again, so we're going to go with choice C. Let's take a look at number 15, another data question. Which choice best describes data from the table that support the researcher's claim? So we're looking for something from the table that supports their claim. First, we need to know what their claim is, right? So these people recently examined several plots, the diverse plant community in southeastern Spain. The researchers calculated that if individual plants were randomly distributed on this particular landscape, only about 15% would be with other plants in patches of vegetation. They counted the number of juvenile plants of five species growing in patches of vegetation, the number of growing alone on bare ground, and compared those numbers what would be expected if the plants were randomly distributed. Based on the results, they claim that plants of these species that grow in close proximity to the other plants gain an advantage at the early development stage. So we're saying that in this particular landscape, if they were randomly distributed, only about 15% would be with other plants, but um, these plants were closer to 50 to 59% found in patches of vegetation, which means they'd be with other plants. So let's see what we want to do here. A, for all five species, less than 75% of juvenile plants were growing in patches of vegetation. So this is a good trick answer, right? That is correct according to the chart, right? But I'm not sure that really supports their claim about these particular plants that they're mentioning here, right? So we'll leave that one, but I don't think that's correct. Species with the greatest number of juvenile plants growing in patches of vegetation was H. stotechus. Uh, that's not true, and it also doesn't support anything. Uh, for T. levantis and whatever, the percentage of juvenile plants growing in patches of vegetation was less than what would be expected if plants were randomly distributed. Well, no, they were saying it would be only about, if they were randomly distributed, there would only be about 15%. So this is actually greater, so that's wrong. For each species, the percent of juvenile plants growing in patches of vegetation was substantially higher that would have been if they were randomly distributed, which does comport with the graph and also supports this, the student's claim here. So it would be choice D. All right, let's get into number 16. Which finding, if true, would most directly support? So once again, we're in the support questions here. These are always tricky, so let's take a look at it. Um, in the mountains of Brazil, Barbacenia termosa and Barbacenia mar macrantha, two plants in the Velocicae family established themselves on soilless, nutrient-poor patches of quartzite rock. Plant ecologists Anna Abrajo and Patricia de Brito Costa used microscopic analysis to determine that the roots, which grow directly into quartzite, have clusters of fine hairs. Further analysis indicates that these hairs secrete both malic and citric acids. Researchers hypothesize that the plants depend on dissolving underlying rock. With these acids, it's a process that only creates channels for continued growth but releases phosphates. So once again, we want to support this viewpoint, which is that these plants are able to enter the rock using acids. So let's see. Other species in the family are found in trade. So as soon as they talk about other species, that probably means that that's not what we're looking for. I mean, that's typically, it's not going to be related to the passage, and it's not going to support the hypothesis. Through B. tamosa and uh, both secrete citric malic acids, each species produces acids in different proportions. The proportion of acids wasn't really what mattered here, so I don't think that would support the hypothesis uh, that these plants can enter these rocks on their own. The roots carve new entry points in rocks even when cracks in the surface are readily available. Uh, that's looking pretty good. I mean, that says that they can crack into the rocks because you might say, well, maybe they just enter existing cracks in the rocks, and that's why they do this. That's how they're able to do it. But you know, this passage is saying they're actually able to break down the rocks with acids, um, so that kind of gets rid of an alternative, which is a good way to support a hypothesis. Um, and then they thrive when transferred to the surface of rocks that do not contain phosphates. Phosphates, uh, phosphorus was mentioned, but that's not the main uh, point of the passage and that wouldn't necessarily support it. So we would go with choice C. Let's get into number 17. Which choice most logically completes the text? So we're looking to complete 
what this passage is telling us here. Uh, herbivora sauropod dinosaurs grow more than 100 feet long and weigh up to 80 tons that some researchers have attributed evolution of sauropods to massive sizes to increase plant production building from high lev levels of atmospheric carbon dioxide. So that's what they're attributing this to. However, there's no evidence of some significant spikes in carbon dioxide levels coinciding with relevant periods in sauropod evolution, such as when first large sauropods appeared. Several sauropod lineages underwent further ev evolution towards gigantic gigantism, or when sauropods reach their maximum known size, suggesting that, this is suggesting that this carbon dioxide hypothesis doesn't necessarily work, right? So, uh, fluctuous action of carbon dioxide affected different sauropods lineages differently. That's okay, right? But we wanted something that really said it didn't depend on the uh, spikes in carbon dioxide levels. B, the evolution of larger body sizes in sauropods did not depend on the increase atmospheric carbon dioxide. So once again, we predicted kind of what we should have there as support. And, um, and the answer choice was almost exactly what I was thinking. So the answer choice would be B. Let's get into number 18. We're looking for what logically completes the text. So we want to see what this is saying and then complete it, right? So in documents called judicial opinions, judges explain the reasoning behind their legal rulings. And in those explanations, they sometimes cite and discuss historical and contemporary philosophers. Legal scholar and philosopher Anita and Allen argues that while judges are naturally inclined to mention philosophers who align with their own positions, the strongest judicial opinions consider and rebut potential objections discussing philosophers whose views conflict with judges' views and could therefore, so we should put something like weaken their opinions, right? So, um, uh, let's see, allow judges to correct judicial opinions without needing to consult philosophical works. No, right? They're trying to both support their opinion with philosophy, um, and they're also looking to use philosophy to discuss potential objections, uh, help judges improve arguments they put forward. So that would help improve their, you know, discussing the objections would help improve their arguments. So that could be it. And then we have C, make judicial opinions more comprehensible to people without training, not really. And then D, bring judicial opinions in line with views that are broadly held among philosophers. That wasn't what this was about. It was about strengthening their opinions. So we're going to go with choice B. All right, number 19, which choice completes the text so it conforms to the conventions of standard English? So now we're getting into grammar-based questions, right? So you can see pronouns here. So we're going to be looking for the antecedent noun to make sure that the pronoun matches. Public awareness campaigns about the need to reduce single-use plastic to be successful, says researcher Kim Borg of Manas University in Australia. When these campaigns give consumers a choice, for example, Japan achieved a 40% reduction in plastic bag use after cashiers were instructed to ask customers whether blank wanted a bag. So they were instructed to ask customers, which is plural, whether, so we want something plural, so it would be choice A, they. All right, let's get into number 20. Which choice completes the text so that it conforms to the conventions of standard English? So once again, you can see a punctuation issue here. In ancient Greece, Epicurean was a follower of Epicurus, a philosopher whose beliefs revolved around the pursuit of pleasure. Epicurus defined pleasure as the absence of pain in the body and of trouble in the blank, that all life's virtues derive from this absence. So the absence of pain in the body and trouble in the soul, positing that all life's virtues derive from this absence. So we put a little line here, like in the middle between soul and positing. What comes after positing that all life's virtues derive from this absence, that's not a complete sentence, right? So these two that require a complete sentence here, right? These are going to be wrong, right? Because a period and a semicolon would separate two complete sentences. We also have the colon, so the absence of pain in the body and trouble in the soul, positing that all life's virtues derive from this absence. That is going to be a little bit of a weird use of a colon. So I think the comma would be correct because the colon... It's not really connected ideas like that. I don't think that the colon would be correct use, so we're gonna go with a comma, choice A. Let's get into number 21. Which choice completes the text so that it conforms to the conventions of standard English? So once again, we have a bunch of pronouns here uh, and similar issues, right? So we're looking to see what works. British scientists James Watson and Francis Crick won the Nobel Prize and they're in part for their 1953 paper announcing the double helix structure of DNA. But it's misleading to say that Watson and Crick discovered the double helix. Blank findings were based on famous X-ray images of DNA fibers. So we're going to be looking for a pronoun here. Uh, and Watson and Crick are two people. So it's going to be there. And of course, we want choice C 
because choice A is they are, and that would be wrong, so we're gonna go with choice C. As you can see, when you understand grammar and you really kind of look at these questions in a detailed fashion, these questions are actually really quite easy, so let's keep going. Let's take a look at number 22. Uh, which choice completes a text that conforms to conventions? So once again, a grammar question here. In 1937, Chinese-American screen actor Anna Mae Wong, who had portrayed numerous villains and secondary characters, but never a heroine, finally got a starring role in Paramount Pictures' Daughter of Shanghai, a film that, blank, expanded the range of possibilities for Asian images on screen. So we have to fill this in here. Uh, finally got a starring role in Paramount Pictures' Daughter of Shanghai, a film that critic Stina Shin, right? So uh, when you're describing a noun, there's something called it a positive phrase, and that's what choice A is kind of doing but the problem is when you put the descriptive part first it's usually just like a title so president abe lincoln for example would not have commas in between it whereas if you said nick comma a tutor comma really enjoys reading that would be a correct use of an appositive phrase and therefore would take two commas but in this instance they're kind of just using it as a title um, and you wouldn't also want a comma after claims so if we get rid of those two then we're really just left with choice c uh, a lot of times less is more with commas. You always want to make sure that if a comma is used, it's used correctly. So we're going to go with C. Let's keep it moving. All right, let's get into the last 11 here. Number 23, which choice completes the text so that it conforms to the conventions of English? So once again, we have a large set of grammar questions. You can see that the, the you know, past few and the remaining few are going to be that way until we switch over to a new type. So Let's get into this one. In 1637, the price of tulips skyrocketed in Amsterdam with single bulbs of rare variety selling for the equivalent of $200,000 in today's U.S. dollars. Some historians blank that this tulip mania was the first historical instance of an asset bubble. So historians, right, that's plural. Some historians claiming have claimed or to claim would all be wrong. Some historians claim, uh, historians is plural, so claim you drop the S, so B is correct. All right, let's move on to number 24. Uh, once again, trying to complete uh, the text with the right phrase. Here we do have uh, a few little punctuation marks, so this might be a little bit of a tricky one. Researchers studying magneto sensation have determined why some soil delling roundworms in the Southern Hemisphere move in the opposite direction of our spending field when searching for food. So now, if we want to evaluate whether these punctuation marks are correct, we need to see if this is a complete sentence. In the Northern Hemisphere, the magnetic field points down into the ground, but in the Southern Hemisphere, it points up towards the surface and away from worms, food sources. So that is a complete sentence, right? So we have a complete sentence here. Now let's check this again. Researchers studying magnetic sensation have determined why some soil dealing groundworms in the Southern Hemisphere move in the opposite direction of the and searching for food. Uh, so that is two complete sentences. So since we have two complete sentences, the correct answer is going to be A. That's the only mark here that could possibly connect two complete sentences. Let's get into number 25. Uh, once again, pronouns, trying to see which fits with the antecedent noun. Scientists believe that unlike most other species of barnacle, turtle barnacles can dissolve the cement-like secretions they use to attach blank to a sea turtle shell. So turtle barnacles was plural. So it in itself will be wrong. So let's just see the other two. Uh, turtle barnacles can dissolve the cement-like secretions they use to attach them or themselves. Well, they're doing it uh, to themselves, so it's going to be choice B, which is the correct answer. All right, let's get into number 26. Once again, another grammar-related question. The classic children's board game Shoots and Ladders is a version of an ancient Nepalese game. In both games, players encounter good or bad spaces while traveling along a path. Landing on one of the good spaces blanks a player to skip ahead. So we're looking at a singular subject. Uh, so when you have a singular subject, you do add the S. Landing on one of the good spaces allows. Uh, so it would be choice A. Get right into number 27. Once again, uh, punctuation marks here. Uh, we do have a transition word like though. Uh, so let's see. Uh, in 1943, the miss of World War II, mathematics professor Grace Hopper was recruited by the US military to help the war effort by solving complex equations. Hopper's subsequent career would involve more than just equations though. As a pioneering computer programmer, Hopper would help usher in a digital age. So this was a complete sentence, right? So that means that D is probably going to be wrong. So let's see. Though, as a pioneering computer programmer, Hopper would help usher in the digital age. So that's okay. I don't think that's necessarily correct. 
The though relates to the fact that her career would involve more than just equations, though. Like, that's just showing a contrast. And then we're going to show what her career actually did entail, right? So it's another perfect use of a colon. So I'm going to go with choice A. And just to reiterate, a colon typically introduces an explanation of a term. So if you're talking about something, the colon can introduce, you know, basically what you're explaining. It could also be a list, of course. But in this instance, it was more of an explanation of what her career did entail. So it would be A. Let's get into number 28. Uh, now we want to, once again, complete the text and make it conform to conventions of English. In 1453, English King Henry VI became unfit to rule. As a result, Parliament, Parliament appointed Richard, third Duke of York, to rule as Lord Protector. Upon recovering two years later, so King Henry recovered, something happens, forcing an angered Richard from the royal court. So it looks like Henry came back, right? So we have Henry resumed his reign, the reign of Henry resumed. Henry's reign resumed, or it was Henry who has resumed his reign. So who recovered, right? Upon recovering two years later, that's a modifying phrase. That's modifying Henry, right? Because Henry is the person that recovered. You also want active voice on the SAT, right? You want subject, verb, then object. You don't want, you know, object, verb, subject, uh, or some other weird mix like these. this choice in particular, right? The reign resumed. Henry resumed his reign, right? So the choice, the correct choice could be answer A. It is in active voice, and it also connects properly with this modifying phrase. Get into number 29. So once again, transition, we want to complete the sentence with the right transition. Although novels and poems are considered distinct literary forms, many authors have created hybrid works that incorporate elements of both. Bernardine Evaristo's Emperor's Babe, Blank is a verse novel, so it's a verse novel, a book-length narrative complete with characters, plot, but conveyed in short, crisp lines of poetry. So this is an example of this poetry prose hybrid, hybrid works, right? So this is an example, so the answer is going to be D, for example. All right, let's get into number 30. Uh, once again, transition word, complete the phrase. At two weeks old, the time their critical socialization period begins, wolves can smell, but cannot yet see or hear. Domesticated dogs, blank, can see, hear, and smell by the end of two weeks. So that is a big difference between wolves and dogs. So some would call that a contrast, right? Wolves can't do this. Dogs can. So I think we're going to go with choice C by contrast because they're talking about two different things. So I'm going to go with C. All right, let's get into number 31. Researchers, blank, blank, and blank, report that while mathematicians may have traditionally worked alone, Evidence points to a shift in the opposite direction. So mathematicians working together. Blank mathematicians are choosing to collaborate with their peers. A trend illustrated by a rise. So they're saying this is a new trend. It's something that is happening more and more often. So similarly, mathematicians are choosing to collaborate with their peers. Um, you could think it's similarly uh, for this reason. Well, they're not doing it because people told them to collaborate with their peers. It's just happening, right? Uh, furthermore, doesn't seem too good. So we have increasingly mathematicians are choosing to collaborate their, with their peers. That would show a trend in, in that direction that they were indicating in uh, the prior sentence. So I think I'm going to go with D over A increasingly. All right, let's get into number 32. Now we're faced with a different type of question here. This is a very common question at the end of the English section here, right? We're going to have this note taking question. And the, here they, it says the student wants to present the study and its findings. Which choice most effectively uses relevant information from the notes? So from my experience, typically these questions are basically just a summary of these notes. The wrong answer choices will just be like one line of the notes, whereas, you know, the correct answer choice is going to basically encompass a majority of these, right? So petrosaurs were flying reptiles. Uh, 2021 study, this person analyzed fragments of the jawbones. She was actually unsure if the bones belonged to juvenile or adults. She used micro scope techniques to determine that they had few growth lines. I've excluded that they belong to juveniles. So it's going to be something about studying pterosaurs, this person, study the bones, use a microscope, and then conclude that they belong to juveniles, right? So, uh, so the petrosaur drone is initially unsure if the bones belong to juvenile results. Well, that doesn't talk about the microscope or anything like that. Uh, look at the Sahara Desert. So once again, that's way too narrow. In 2021 study, she, or he or she used advanced microscope techniques, analyzed jaw bones, microscopes millions of years ago. Um, that's pretty good. Let's see if D is better. It doesn't 21 study. This person determined that petrosaur drum was looking at the Sahara Desert had few growth lines relative to the bones, fully grown petrosaurs, thus bone juvenile. So that summarizes the whole thing. So the answer choice would be D.
All right, let's get into 33. Once again, we have this note taking summary question. It's just going to be the one that summarizes the notes in there entirely, right? So which choice most effectively uses relevant information from the notes? The student wants to compare two women's contributions. So we're looking for the one that fully compares two women's contributions. So African American women played prominent roles in the civil rights movement, including the March on Washington, civil rights activist Anna Hedgeman, one of the March organizers, political advisor, worked for President Truman. Uh, Daisy Bates. So here's the second person. Um, she was a journalist and advocate for school desegregation. Hedgeman worked behind the scenes to make sure women is included in the lineup of speakers. And then Bates was the sole woman to speak, delivering a brief memorable address. So Hedgeman was an activist. She set up this situation where Bates, who was also an activist, came to deliver an address, which was very popular. Hedgeman and Bates contributed to the march in different ways. Bates, for example, delivered a brief memorable address. So that's totally minimizing Hedgeman, who was half of these bullet points. Hedgeman worked in politics and helped organize the march, while Bates was a journalist and school desegregation advocate. Now, that doesn't really talk about her speech, which is these last few lines, right? Hedgeman worked to have a speaker, and then Bates was the speaker, right? So I think that's wrong. See, although Hedgeman worked behind the scenes to make sure a woman speaker was included, Bates was the sole woman to speak at the march. That's pretty good. It encompasses Hedgeman's work. It also encompasses Bates' work. So I'm going to say C is probably correct. The many African-American women, including Bates, has been fought for civil rights, but only one spoke in the march. That's too vague. It doesn't talk about the work that they did. So I'm going to go with choice C. All right, guys, that's it. I finished every single question on module one. Make sure to hit that subscribe button because I'm going to be dropping answer explanations for every single question that the College Board releases for the digital SAT. So if you want to improve your score and you want to get better at the SAT, make sure to hit that button. I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.